Let's now turn our attention to Luke chapter 7. We are continuing on our journey to understand the parables. And out of 40-some parables, we're going to, this I believe is our sixth, but we're going to take a break once again from the parables so we can study the covenants, because when we understand the covenants, the parables will make a lot more sense. So right now I'm a little bit restricted because I cannot make references or I may say things where I assume that you already know what I'm talking about and you may not. So we'll go back and study the covenants and then we'll come back to the parables. And we may even go back and re-study the parables that we've studied in light of the covenants. So let's go to chapter 7, the Gospel of Luke. And there we read verses 40. To 43. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water to feed my, uh, to water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. The Bible makes clear to us that the parables of Jesus were not always understood immediately and often Jesus explained it to his disciples in private. The Old Testament tells us in prophecies about Jesus that he will be the one who comes and teaches in parables. Within these parables we find the gospel and the mission of Jesus Christ as it relates to humanity. Humanity can be divided into two basic types of people. Spiritually. Those that recognize their need of salvation and they recognize the depth of their sin one time. The other is a group that does not acknowledge or recognize the depth of their sin and thus finds very little need for salvation. In today's humanistic world, there are people out there who question this idea of sin and wrong and forgiveness and eternal life. They don't see the condition of sin. They don't seek salvation. They don't seek eternal life. They think, this is it. This is life. It's done. It's done. It's finished. There's a philosophy out there that eternal life is genetic in that. When you have children, those children have your genes. And so you live through your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. So you never die. Because your cells, your DNA continues living. That is another interpretation of this world. And therefore we see no need of recognition of sin or salvation. In a few hundred years before Jesus, we know that the Hellenistic government the Greek and Greco-Roman governments took over the temple in Jerusalem. 
And in the taking over of the Temple of the Jerusalem, they forced Jews to break their rules and their Jewish laws, imposed on them Hellenistic and pagan teachings and views. So much so that in the temple they brought the idol, the statue of Zeus, and put it in the temple. And a great movement arose through the sons of one of the priests of Israel, Judas Maccabeus. And through that we have what's called the Maccabean revolt that brought down the Greco-Roman government as far as the rule in Israel was concerned. The temple was being rebuilt and cleansed. And out of that movement of the Jews came a group of people that became so pious in reaction to the Hellenistic pagan uh, imposition on them. They became so pious that they, that they followed every minute detail of the laws of Moses. They created 613 laws, not just the laws in the Exodus and, Levit and Leviticus. They ended up adding to it. There was 365 laws just on what you should not do. Never mind the laws on what you should do. Just on what you should not do. Then there were people who were so prone and committed to keeping those laws, making sure that they were holy, they were righteous. That they were seen as the ideal of the Jewish nation. And those were known in the time of Jesus as the Pharisees. As the Pharisees. Those that kept the law and judged themselves by the keeping of their law. One of those leaders of the Pharisees invited Jesus to his home. His name was Simon. And in that invitation, and during that meal, some things happened that opens to us the gospel of Jesus Christ and the beauty of the forgiveness of God. Let me read to you chapter 7 and verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I'm going to keep explaining what's going on here so we understand. When it says reclining at the table, I know many of us have the picture of Jesus and the 12 disciples in our home sitting at the table, right? And chairs there. That's a European interpretation of the table and chairs where Jesus had the Last Supper. But the Last Supper, like this supper, was not like that. It was on a table that was low to the ground and they had big pillows. And people would recline on that pillow and eat from the table using their right hand, not their left, because they used to use the left hand for cleaning themselves. So they would recline there. And when they were reclining, their feet would be sticking outward, backward. So the word here says, he went into the Pharisee's house and he did what? He reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. How is it that a woman of sin, known to the people of that town, can enter into the house of this super righteous man? How can that be? The way the houses were designed were very similar to what we have in our villages, even now. That you have a few rooms, which are mostly your, 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 your sleeping area, sleeping quarters. Maybe one room where you store all of your bedding and beds and things like that. And one area where you cook or maybe keep a cow or two, whatever. Uh, that's kind of, and then there's a small little wall around. So, the house included, entering into the house, once you get through the gate, 
That gate that enclosed the wall was considered the entrance into the house, although it may be in the open. And at the gate, there was normally a little uh, bowl of water by the threshold so people could wash their feet. Oftentimes, the richer people had somebody who would have a basin, who would have a servant, who would come and wash their feet when they came into the house. That was almost, in fact, it was a requirement, especially if you invited somebody, to show that they were now coming into your home, passing that threshold. Passing that threshold became a very important part of that relationship. Once you pass that threshold, you are now in that home and you are their highest guest and you will provide, you will be protected and everything you need will be provided for and you are now as, as, as the most important person in that, in, in that building, that guest. So Jesus was here as the guest because the man had invited him. And here is this woman and she comes in, not into the rooms but into the larger area where they did not restrict people Oftentimes, say when there was somebody important who came into the village or into the town, people would come to listen to them and they would sit on the walls and listen in on the conversations. This woman heard that Jesus had come to the house of the Pharisee. Imagine what kind of guts it takes. When you know that the whole world is going to look at you and say, hey, look, there she is. Look at who is here. People are going to gossip. They're going to whisper to one another. Look, 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 look who's here. A woman of shame. Known to everybody, not only as the person, but also for her works and her deeds. She comes. But before she comes, she prepares herself. She searches her soul and her heart to see what is the most precious thing that she has. Before she comes. She comes with a bottle of perfume made of alabaster. The bottle was made of alabaster, which contained this expensive perfume, the most precious thing that she had. Then we told, as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. I want to take note that. To us, it seems odd that any woman would touch the feet of another man and cry with tears on going on his feet. But to have this woman crying over this man, the worst of the worst, Touching and crying over the best of the best. What an irony. The most righteous being who is as righteous as God himself reclines there and allows the worst of the worst to come in contact with him in a way that is unacceptable to common society. The Jewish Talmud actually records that many priests who had led sinners to God had, the, had women who had given up their sins and confessed their sins and found God that the Talmud tell, tell records that they also went and cried tears on the feet of the priests and wiped them with the hair. So this was not an uncommon, unheard of action. 
but to have this woman wipe the feet with this man. This was something that was gossip worthy. And this was something that diminished, reduced the stature of the man who called himself a prophet. The man who was considered a priest. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. Listen to this. If he was a prophet, the Jews believe that the prophets do everything. Why? Because they know the stories about Elijah and, er and, and Elisha. They know the stories of the Old Testament where the prophets knew when something was going to happen. So he said, if this man was a prophet, he would know who this is. Therefore, he cannot be a prophet. The attitude of the Pharisee is obvious in many ways that he does not regard Jesus in a high position. He didn't call Jesus there to honor him. He, ca he called Jesus there to berate him, to diminish him, to question him, and allowed everybody to come and watch as he comes and reduces Jesus to nothing. That was his attempt. It wasn't to glorify Jesus, and we'll see that. Now, Jesus, he does not say to Simon Peter, don't worry, Simon Peter. I said, not Simon Peter, sorry. Don't worry, Simon. By the way, there's tons of Simons in the Bible. Every time we turn a page, there's a different Simon. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon is already thinking these things about Jesus. That, hey, he's not a prophet. So when he says, Simon, I got something to tell you. But Simon says, yeah, what? Tell me, teacher. When he calls him teacher, this is sarcasm. This is absolute sarcasm. Why? Because he does not accept him as a teacher. He said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? One denarii was equivalent to one day's work. 500 days worth of work is like a year and a half salary that was forgiven. That's a big deal. And the other guy, 10 weeks worth of salary is forgiven. So who has reason to be more grateful? Who has reason to be more joyous? The guy who had the bigger debt. So Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. By the way, I should mention, uh, when in verse 41, it says he owed him money. And verse uh, 42, Three, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. In Luke, here, in Luke 11, when you go to the Lord's Prayer, we have Lord's Prayer in Luke and we have Lord's Prayer in Matthew. In Luke, the word is debt. Forgive us our debts. Right? As we forgive our debtors. Do you know what happens in Matthew? Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. The word that is used here in the Aramaic and in the Greek is used for both. It's used for sin and for debt. Same word. So here is Jesus working with these guys and now turning the tables on him. Where he's going to convert the monetary debt. He's going to take that word in the monetary money debt and he's going to convert that into sin instead. 
You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me give any water for my feet. Now here, Jesus begins to open up the heart of Simon. If anybody comes to your home and you don't invite them in, Somebody you know, just by name maybe, you'd invite them in. And in our culture, the first thing you do is have a seat and we run and go get a glass of water. If somebody does it, that person leaves your home and goes and tells 10 people, you know I went to Varghese's house and his wife didn't even give me a glass of water. I can't say that about because she doesn't give me water, she gives me lemonade. <laughs> But this is the equivalent. You did not even give me the basics. When a person was not given water to wash their feet, it was considered an insult. You invite a guest and you don't give them water to wash their feet. It is a direct insult. No questions asked. And anybody present would know there. But look at the humility of our Lord. He doesn't walk away and say, Listen, dude, you didn't give me water to wash my feet. I'm leaving. I don't want to eat with you. I can go and eat over there. Nah. Jesus put up with that insult immediately because he knew he had to. He had to do the teaching to bring people to God. You did not give me any water to wash my feet. Not even water. But look. Look at the difference. Look at the irony. But she wet my feet with her tears. The value of even one tear. You know, when you love somebody, and if that person begins to cry, what do you do? If you have a heart, you go over to that person right away. And it's, oh, don't cry. Am I right? Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Don't want to see any tears. That's what we do. That is the value of the tears. And she is shedding so many tears that the feet of Jesus are wet. They need to be dry. She has not stopped crying. She wiped her tears with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not, kissed, has not stopped kissing my feet. The tradition was, when you invited a guest to your home, you greet them. With a holy kiss or with a kiss. You wash their feet. You let them know that they're welcome, that they're honored, that they're loved. The kiss that was given, and we know this, the holy kiss, the cheek. Look at the extremities. You could not even give me a kiss on my cheek. But this woman is kissing my feet. Dirty, filthy, unwashed feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she had poured perfume on my feet. When a guest came, it was customary to give them a little bit of olive oil. Olive oil was cheap and plentiful. And to welcome that guest, you would give them that little bit of oil. What they would do is they'd take it, put it on their hair, and put it on their face. You remember when Jesus said, when you fast, don't fast like the Pharisees. Put oil on your hair and on your 
He says, you didn't give me olive oil to put on my head. But look at her. The most expensive liquid. Expensive perfume. Not on my head, but on my feet. What an unbelievable irony. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. This passage, this passage, if you translate this back to the Greek, it would tell us this, that because her sins are forgiven, she is expressing the love because of that forgiveness that came before. Not in order that she may be forgiven. Why is she crying? Because she received forgiveness. She, for, she, she got the forgiveness when the entire world pointed to her, when the entire world looked down on her, and when she had taken the value of her earnings and invested them in that perfume, she took those earnings and she sacrificed them. Why? Because she appreciated the level of her forgiveness that she had experienced prior to this experience. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. This statement, your sins are forgiven. If you go back and look at Bible commentaries on this, you will find that the statement actually means, it really, really, really means, is not that your sins are going to be forgiven. It's not that your sins are, uh, are, are kind of forgiven. It is done. It's past. It's done forever. She is a new person. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus answered. By the way, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's very important for us to understand this word faith over here. This faith does not talk about the strength of her faith. When we understand the Jewish word faith, here, because this was in terms of the context of the Jewish religion. When we talk about this faith, it is talking about that faith that the Jews had in God, their God. So, your faith. So, I'll give you an example. I could have faith maybe in a witch doctor. Could I have faith maybe in Brahma or in Ram or maybe in Buddha. So, that level of faith of a strict Hindu is as strong as my faith in God. So this faith here does not measure the quality of my faith or the quality of the Hindu's faith. It does not. What it measures is the quality of the one in whom we have the faith. That is the Old Testament understanding of faith, by the way. The Jews understood that their God was all-powerful. He was the creator. He can do anything. He can part rivers. He can destroy the snakes. He can heal people. He can raise the dead. It was the quality not of her faith, but on who she believed. For I know whom I believe. 
And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep me until that day. It was that faith in God, the creator. It was that faith. When God sees that kind of response from you, when God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, 1 John 1, 9, where if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It is the same faith that we know. In Hebrews, we see it. In Genesis, we see it differently. In Genesis, we see Abraham told to take a son up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there. Three days journey. Why three days? God gave Abraham time to change his mind. Lots of time to think about what he was going to do. Go there. But you notice in Genesis, when Abraham gets to the mountain, he said to his servants, you stay here and we will go up and make the sacrifice and who will come back we will come back not one person the same two people abraham believed that even if he sacrificed the son god would resurrect him the same god who gave him the miracle of the son will resurrect him and bring him back and hebrews tells us that abraham had the faith that even if he killed his son, God would resurrect him. The same God who gave him out of a dead womb would raise him up. Amen. That is the faith to know and trust God. And that's why the Bible says, And Abraham trusted God and it was counted to him righteousness. What a beautiful message in every parable we have. Jesus calls us in the same way like the Pharisees. Often we think we're better than everybody else. We know we have Jesus Christ and the Muslims don't and the Hindus don't and the Buddhists don't. And maybe other denominations don't. I hear prayers all the time, especially in Urdu. They say, we're so great, we're so grateful that we have a living God. And everybody else doesn't. Well, they do because I believe those non-biblical gods all end up being the same one, which is Lucifer. Is very much alive. He's also a living God. But we take that attitude of righteousness and we look down on those that we don't think would be accepted by God. The Bible tells us even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For those that are whole, those that are righteous, don't need salvation. They don't need Jesus Christ. That's why the Sermon on the Mount starts with the Beatitudes. To bring us to humility. To bring us to confession. It is only there that we can appreciate who Jesus is and what he did for us. Amen. There's nothing good in us. And like this woman who now is doing what we can consider good works, she's doing it not that she may be forgiven. She has been forgiven. And now this is a public confession that Jesus is making for her forgiveness of sins. My friends, before we can claim any relationship with God, 
before we can even go to Jesus Christ. We have to come to the conclusion that there's something very wrong with us. And no matter what our righteous works may be, there's no value to them. So I like the Pharisee and the publican in the temple. The Pharisee goes and says, thank you that I'm not like those that I don't do this and I don't do this, I don't do this, and I do this and I do this and I do this. And the publican hides in the corner and covers himself and confesses his sins to God. Forgive me, he says, for I am a sinner. And Jesus said, that I say unto you, that the publican went home righteous rather than the Pharisee. The attitude of the Pharisee is very much alive in all of us. All of us. And it's easy to look at people around us and say that they're not righteous enough. They don't follow this and they don't follow that. That is not the spirit that brings us to Jesus Christ. What brings us is, is a problem with me. And then when we have had a conversion experience, we can tell the story to somebody else that look what God did for me. Look what God did for me. And he can do the same for you. This is the message of every Christian. Not to point to their sins, but to point to ours and let the world know that God is taking care of them through Jesus Christ. Amen. My prayer for you is the same as for myself. Life is a daily struggle, daily struggle, moment by moment. We have to make decisions. May God grant that we make those decisions based on the Spirit of God that changes our hearts and converts us. A righteous law in our hearts that we desire to do that which God wants us to do. That we may be examples and have the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. That people can look at us and say, all right, that person used to be mean, nasty, terrible, selfish person, but now look what's happened to him. I want to be like that. That is what opens doors to bring people. May God bless you as we continue our struggle and strengthen in Jesus Christ. Amen.